pleasure of being here. How's the sound? Good. Okay. Um, thank you, Sony, and thanks to Caroline and Katie, who is maybe somewhere, um, for making this possible. It's been a real treat to be up here. Um, it's an honor to share the stage with Taylor. She's an incredible force. Um, thank you, Taylor. Um, I also want to thank Gila Zipporah. Is that how you pronounce it? I'm just going to call you Gila Chase. <laughs> um, Gila has done so much um, to advocate for this work and to help me, she, they, sorry, help me with this installation this morning. Um, so thank you, Gila. Um, just going to take a little breath because like I get a little bit anxious. <laughs> And thanks to you all for gathering here. Um, it's a beautiful day. It's a little bit hot. If you get hot in the sun, these seats are open. Come on in and get cozy. Um, so I am going to talk about death and decay. And I figured, what better way to talk about such a serious topic than with a little bit of levity? So I have a few pieces to read um, and a little bit to talk about. Um, I don't know how much time I have, but I'll just dive in. Death is a thing I'm still learning to unravel. It was easy when I was young, when my first pet, a goldfish, died. I drew a picture of him, and underneath it inscribed a poem. Fishy poo, fishy poo. How I loved you, fishy poo. I got you on Monday. You died on Wednesday. And that's the story of fishy poo. <laughs> <laughs> Groundbreaking, I know. Um, clearly a future poet. Uh, but so that poem gave me solace during my first encounter with death. That act of creation, the turning outward, it carried my grief out into the world. I intuitively memorialized my dear two-day friend, and in doing so, I crafted a thing in which our relationship, although it was only two days, could continue. I still remember this fish, and I know the poem by heart. It wasn't until my second encounter with death, goldfish again, that I turned inward, a practice that I would repeat again and again, first with my grandmother, then with my grandfather, later with my aunt, and finally with my friends, until more than 20 years after the goldfish days of youth, I would begin to learn, to relearn, how to move through grief. Short little piece, but I thought that it was useful um, I've encountered a lot of death in my life, and um, I don't know how to grieve all the things. Um, a lot of the times it's members of my community who, or of past communities who I have no longer have any real continual relationship with. Um, and I'm not a part of that community anymore. And so I, I've, this, this whole thing has been a process for me in learning how to grieve and learning how to understand death in my own self. Um, so this started, this whole project started because I wanted to explore decay through art and through science. And um, the homestead kind of came to me. Um, I was incredibly inspired by this place because of there's so much decay. I mean, this this tree that is also a piece of farm equipment, and you can't tell where one thing ends and the other begins, um, is just a perfect representation of what I'm looking at. It's the boundaries between bodies um, blurred and implicated in one another. Um, I've also learned through this process that um, the act of creation, and I knew it when I was a kid and I forgot it somehow, the act of creation when we are experiencing loss is a way to move through that grief. By engaging in something physical or um, writing something, putting it into the world, that creates a token for that person or a goldfish. So I'm going to read a poem that I wrote actually before the residency began when I was beginning to look into some of these things. 
because um, it's dealing with some of the tensions that I feel when, as approaching this work. <laughs> it's called Necrobiome. She lights a tea candle before I settle into an absent stranger's home. We'd been here once before, but it was daytime, thin and sun flooded. I stumble, bones brittle under the weight of this flesh and how tightly it winds around itself. I have to speak their names. She says in that way, she says things. In that burrowing way that makes space for itself, that reaches towards things folded into tendons and tangled. I wish I could tell her, in the ocean a blue whale dies, bubbling as it descends, and when it finally finds stillness, the whole world gathers. But I lost a friend to sepsis under the freeway, and I still don't know what to do with memory of him, and still don't know how to unravel the abscess, and still don't know how many days exhaust shrouded his body, tossed below by passing cars. And I still don't know. So I can't speak of whales, just light another candle and watch their names exhaled into flames. So that poem for me, I think, was a process. Um, but I think it really highlights some of the tensions because like, I wanna look at decay and I wanna look at this beautiful intermixing of bodies in the way decay can be this really gorgeous process, but also what do you do with violence? What do you do with the violence that the uh, communities of color face? What do you do with genocides? What do you do with max, mass extinctions of species? What do you do with that violence against self that I've seen so many times? Um, and I don't know the answer to that. Um, it's resists romanticizing. So I have a few more pieces to read. Clearly, I have a lot of pages. Mm -hmm. So I, I came here because I wanted to write poetry, mostly. Um, I had been in this poetry phase, I guess, and I'd been writing a lot of poetry. And I got here, and I sat down to write poems and nothing. It was just like crap. I could not write a poem. <laughs> so I did something that uh, I haven't done, which is writing creative nonfiction. Um, I've done fiction, I've done poetry. I don't know. Okay. In a magazine in the shelves made of cranberry crates, in the old cabin at the Moon Randolph homestead, there is a picture of my grandmother as a girl leaning on a stone tomb in front of St. Mary's Church in England. The photographer is my great-grandfather, Clifton Adams, one of the early color photographers for National Geographic magazine. He died when my grandmother, Amy, was only eight years old. There is something in loss that urges me to trace, to spin backwards, to unspool the stories that brought me here now. How many artists lived in the shadows, their artwork celebrated only after their death? Is this the same phenomenon? Is there something in the gap that asks us to reach? Amy would grow up, go to college, meet a man named Philip West, have children and create her, ho her own home in California, thousands of miles from her mother's home in Michigan and even farther from her father's home in Virginia. In Fillmore, they settled in among the orange groves, their lives perfumed in blossom each spring. A place is not an inert thing. When we live somewhere, when we settle, we become tangled in that place and in exchange that place tangles in us. Geographers know this, as did my great grandfather. It was not enough to photograph St. Mary's Church or the wildflowers at Thurlmuir Lake, that is a mouthful. The landscape, whether human made or natural, became storied only with the presence of a human subject like my grandmother, like my great aunt. Now these photographs are entangled in me, a family album folded in old magazines that have been kept and cataloged by strangers. When my mother was 17 years old, her father took a trip to the ocean off the coast of Ventura with two of his friends. 
Philip loved to sail, loved the vast ocean, loved to, to taste salt on his lips. He did this often, as often as he could given the demands of his job as a judge on the Superior, California Superior Court. This trip was one of many, but he would not return. Of the three men who went out that day, only one would survive. The way my family tells it, after the storm hit and tore the three men from their boat, one found shore on the Channel Islands, scrambled to the rock and clung there. The way my family tells it, this man could only watch as my grandfather reached for him as a great wave rose behind the drowning man and swallowed him whole. As a girl, the only recurring dream I had was of drowning. This was not a logical dream as dreams seldom are. I've known how to swim longer than I can remember. I grew up in the water. But the dream water didn't know this. It slurped me down like a writhing worm, down into the impenetrable darkness. I woke up unable to catch my breath. After Philip's death, Amy and her youngest daughter left the orange groves and moved west. They settled into a small apartment in Ventura, a city in which my grandmother lives to this day. She will tell you this move to the shore has little to do with the death of her husband. She will tell you it was time for a change, that she needed to downgrade. She will tell you Ventura was a nice community. But from where she lives today on a boat docked in the Ventura Harbor, you can look out over the waves to the Channel Islands, to the place my grandfather, her husband, was last seen alive. I do not know what traumas survive in the other men's families. The women of the Adams West lineage each have their own story to tell of unfolding loss. We know impermanence, and each of us experiences this in our own way. There are stories I cannot tell, they are not mine to share. I will tell you that in the depths of my own undoing, I found the ocean. I will tell you that in the face of great loss, I picked up my life and left. I will tell you that I've created my own home, a thousand miles from my childhood home. There is a heritage here, not only in my own family, but also in the breadth of families born from European lineage scattered across America. We are settlers, colonizers. This is a truth we must grapple with, expose, and undo. The very act that allowed the Moon Randolph Homestead to exist also drove countless indigenous peoples from their homes, disrupting their communities. In Butterflies and Railroad Ties, her chapbook about the history of this place, Caitlin DeSilvey writes first about the slim trail that cut across the bare footholds, foothills between the Rattlesnake Mountains and the broad Missoula Valley, where the Salish, Kootenai, Ponderay, and Nez Perce people traveled, camped, and harvested the native bitterroot. The very flower that, due to white settler colonialism, has since become the most rare, sour, rare, rare state flower in the U.S. And far away in the Pacific Ocean, we see another consequence. The abalone that once sustained the Northern California coastal tribes suffers. Warming waters, destruction of kelp forests, and the subsequent proliferation of purple sea urchin have decimated abalone populations. I set out to write about decay, about the processes that occur when a body falls, about the way decay patches the living with scraps of the dead. This is a beautiful thought, the renewal, the circle complete. But even at this homestead, so immersed in natural processes of decay, we can hear the sounds of the city landfill. Walk above the orchard and you can see the torn hillside. The space between here and there makes clear the tension between the life-giving processes of decay and my culture's heritage. Between the decay of the singular organism and the decay of populations, of species, of cultures, of hillsides and of shorelines. So it was, thanks. It was really cool to find pictures of my family in this place. Um, I had like completely forgotten that that was a thing in my family. Um, but it just brought up so much that I felt like I couldn't ignore and I had to write about it. Um, a lot of my work is uh, working with heritage and you know, what do we save and what do we allow to decay? Um, one thing, I mentioned Caitlin DeSilvey, who is one of the original archivists here at the Homestead. Um, her work has been hugely inspiring to me. Um, in her book, Curated Decay, she writes, objects generate meaning not just in their preservation and persistence, 
but also in their destruction and disposal. And she's talking mostly about like the way the non-human world interacts with material, that in, in that it generates some, a different kind of meaning, a, a more than human meaning. Um, and I like that. But, it, but, then, but then what do you do with the torn hillside? What do you do with the torn shoreline? So I have a few more things to read, but how are we on time? Okay. We're good. How are you all feeling? Because I also have art to talk about, and I don't want to like take up too much space. Okay. Yeah, like <laughs> <laughs> um. This one's short. In the cabinet mountains, we find a black bear, mummified, stinking, and without its head. Someone has taken the skull. I too covet skulls. Somehow it feels as though they tell us something about the animal, how it lived, ate, sensed its world. But at the lake, we read fairy tales to each other. The one about the stepmother who kills the boy, butchers him, cuts him into sausage for her husband's dinner. He likes it. He asks for seconds. The girl knows what has happened. She gathers the boy's bones, buries, under the, buries them under the juniper tree, and he is reborn. I am 25 and living in my old minivan. Somewhere outside of Elko, I find a fawn, dead on the side of the road, and cannot stop the impulse to gather the weedy mustard flowers sprouting just off the highway and lay them on the young deer's chest to put her to rest. What is it that compels us to gather in grief? In Papua New Guinea, people create Malangan, monuments to the dead. And this is from Curated Decay. Mourners construct these assemblages of wood or woven vines and decorate the surface with carvings of animals, birds, shells, and human figures. The perishable monument is placed over a human grave as a marker. After a certain amount of time has passed when the human soul is understood to have escaped the body, the Malangan are taken from the graves and set in a location where they are left to rot. Once the Malangan have decomposed, the residual matter is gathered to fertilize local gardens. We gather gifts for the departed. We gather keepsakes to help us remember. But what grows from these things? In the mountains, I kneel to the bear, to the pile of fur and bone and claw. Beneath all that decay, there is something human something that hums with the delicate rhythm of bare feet on soil. I pick up three claws that have dehissed from their body and place them in a small, small bag. Ecologists call carrion a resource pulse. Microbes, blowflies, and scavengers stitch fragments of the carcass to their own bodies and in doing so return vital nutrients into circulation. When something dies, life gathers around it tends to the body in a way so foreign to us in the West that it seems grotesque. But is this not also a funeral rite? Do we not also gather around the bodies of our loved ones? Do we not also divvy up their earthly possessions? And why is the human body held so separate that we lock it up in a box, locked inside another box, or else burn it beyond recognition? And why is it that I feel in taking the cause that I have somehow transgressed is it the bear's humanness that grips me? Is it the fairy tale? Or is it something else? Some subtraction from an equation that no longer makes sense. Thanks. So when Taylor and I were, oh, I'm sorry, I'm fiddling with the mic. <laughs> uh, when Taylor and I were talking about decay, um, I kept coming back to this idea of unraveling. I kept coming back to the woven texture of lives, the way that we're patched with pieces of each other. Um, and I felt compelled to work with that within that medium, within the woven and the string. Um, so I started making these like little tiny lichen sculpt sculptures, um, which were really fun to make. but. You know, when I was trying to figure out how to do it, I was playing around with the wire and the fabric. And I left, I like was really happy with something. And I left it on the table outside the cabin um, and went inside for a bit. 
And then when I came back out, it was gone. And I thought, okay, maybe it was the wind. So I like did concentric circles around the table, trying to find this little sculpture, couldn't find it. And when Caroline or Katie, I can't remember, maybe both, and I were talking, um, one of them suggested grackles, that the grackles might have taken it. Um, which made me start thinking about like, what is this place asking for? Um, what is the more than human world here? How, how is the human decaying human world feeding the more than human world? Um, again, I'm gonna quote Caitlin DeSelvi. She's been amazing to read. Um, she talks about um, decay as a process of um, increasing entropy. Um, and here's what she says about it. Perhaps entropy can be best described as possibility rather than through reference to chaos and disorder. Entropy increases the number of possibilities available to a system. As the constraints that inform a living organism dissolve, and the entropy of the organism increases. Even in death, new possibilities are sown. That's kind of part of why I wanted to do this sculpture um, installation. Um, because it's like a dispersal. Decay is like a dispersal of our parts. Um, and we, so much becomes possible. We take on new, like a thousand new forms, fungus, animals, plants, um, soil. So I have one more piece to read, and it's kind of long. Um, and I'm wondering, would you grab my water? Where are your hiding places? Did you also hide in the weeds, in the broken bottles and untucked corners? Do we forget these margins as we grow, far too serious to drift into the chaos of leafy spurge and car parts? I fell in love with in-between places. Here in that overgrown place, between house and fence where it is always damp and web strewn, and where someone once planted canna lilies. Here too, in the abandoned on-ramp between lake and highway where leaves collect in cracks and tiny plastic nozzles popped from spray paint cans crunch underfoot. There's something here about forgetting, about wrapping my body in leaves and layers of paint, about being caught in someone else's web. There's something here about slipping away. There are a thousand ways for things to decay. I've made a list. Each time I find a new permutation, who is unraveling? Who is the unraveler? And what processes allow this to happen? Take termites, take wood. Millions of years ago, trees fell, and when they fell, they stayed there, whole. The very thing that allowed these giants to spring up and hold the sky, the lignin in their great trunks kept them whole in death. Energy bound up in impenetrable molecules, an empty niche. Fungi crept in, tiny little spores that took root in the piles of wood, white rot, brown rot. They grew and grew and, un and learned to unfold the cellulose buried inside. People think termites eat wood. I thought they did. I thought they ate their homes into being, but they don't. They tuck spores in their mouths. They farm fungus. We don't like termites or fungus at least when they threaten our homes, our fences, the wood we use to build our lives. In lockdown, I stare at my walls each day when I grow tired of the screen of little faces stuck in boxes all stacked atop each other, I watch paint come alive. This house is growing. I am in bed, staring into my green walls and beneath the paint dry drywall and beneath the drywall insulation and beneath the insulation wood. I think Whose home did we destroy for this house? I think, how many lives uprooted? 
In the archives at the Moon Randolph Homestead, I count nine filing cabinets, each with, which its own, each with its own drawers filled with objects, each with its own list to tally these objects. In the bottom drawer of the white cabinet, I find a tiny nest built of fiber, of fur, of torn paper. This drawer is also inventoried. It does not count the nest, at least not in words, but at each corner of the three stapled pages, pieces are missing, torn away by little rat teeth, an inventory in erasure. What is crumbling? What is built? When the reporter comes, I tell her, decay reveals the process of becoming. I think this is true. We are always becoming, always exchanging little bits of ourselves for something of another. But we like to think the boundary between me and you is solid, that the skin contains us and keeps us whole. When I am anxious, when I spend too much time alone, I notice the places my skin feels too thin, where my underneath presses through the surface, the tendons on the inside of my wrist, the bottom of my left, left rib cage, my sit bones scraping flesh from the inside, where something inside me reaches out to be seen or maybe to give itself away. Or take phosphorus. We keep it in our bones, but where does it come from? It is a hard mineral to come by in the more than human world. Most of the world's phosphorus is locked up in rocks. So when something dies and microbes colonize the fallen body, they harvest the phosphorus, turn it back into circulation. I call Alana Shaw one night after class. She tells me that in the process of breaking down phosphates, a volatile organic compound is released. She tells me this is the one soil process that can be sensed by the human body. This compound is named geosmin. It is the smell of soil after a rain, the earthiness of sliced beets. It is also the smell of rotting leaves. She says that the threshold between the divine rich scent of earth and the revolting scent of decay is thin as a spider's web. Our bodies are tuned to geos geosmin's frequency. We know when things take turn sour. Or take trust, take a friendship, how easily it unravels when we face the underworld, when we come too close to the edge. I am 14 when my sister leaves for college, 14 and unsure of myself. I shop where she shops, listen to the music she plays. This leaving is a loss, but not the same loss as when she returns, rail thin and circled in the dark. I run to catch her, drink what she drinks, smoke her cigarettes, I will not admit I am angry, not for years, and by then the anger will have undone me. We are both negative charges waiting for the other to flip. We cannot hold each other's underworld self. The old stories knew this. In the stories, Inanna is queen of heaven and earth with a throne carved from the holy tree. She is clever, willful, beloved. Many have tried to explain her motivation for shutting it all to journey into the underworld. Some take it at her word. She must attend the funeral, funeral rites of her sister's husband. Others believe she had become greedy. After all, she ventured to the heavens to steal holy knowledge from the gods. Why wouldn't she also steal knowledge from the underworld? Still others take a different stance. What does all the knowledge of heaven and earth mean without first understanding the pain of death? Psychologists have a name for this. They call it post-traumatic growth. The observation that after a trauma like the death of a child, many people find new capacities to love, to cherish the world, to live fully. For these people, life becomes purposeful, filled with a new kind of meaning. But these people would do anything to have their children back in the world of the living. And as to Inanna, do we need a reason, an ultimate truth? Reality is rarely one thing. What we do know is upon descending, Upon shedding layer after layer of earthly possessions, Inanna enters the chamber of her sister, Arishkagil, queen of the underworld. We do know that when she enters, Arishkagil turns her into a corpse, a piece of rotting meat. We, we know that Arishkagil hangs her corpse from a hook. The ways of the underworld are perfect. We also know that waiting for Inanna in the land of the living is her servant, Ninshaber. And when Inanna does not return, Ninjabur pleads to the gods to help her bring Inanna back. In alternate moments, I am Inanna, Arishkagil, and Ninjabur. I can never be no more than one. I cannot venture into the underworld and rule there too. I cannot, 
help my friends return if I am also subterranean. What brings Anana back, to, back in the end are two spirits who have taken the form of flies. They feed Anana the food of life, pour the water of life down her throat. So, take flies. They are the first animals to colonize carrion. They can smell the scent of death from a mile away. Corpse is nest for them, and inside they lay their eggs with ample food for young larvae to grow fat. We don't like flies. We turn from maggots in disgust. But tucked in one of the oldest written stories we have is another perspective. Flies as life givers. Flies as powerful spirits who can return the dead to the land of the living. Flies, blowflies specifically, exist not only in the margin between life and death, but because of this margin. So maybe it is not really a margin at all. In my life, I have come to know a great number of people who have been told for one reason or another that who they are is wrong somehow. I myself learned this at an early age. I can track all the ways I am wrong from elementary school to middle school, high school, and beyond. Too sensitive, too queer, too angry. And through it all, I found the places that reflected me, the dark places, the weedy places, the wild places, and the feral ones too. Like in myths and fairy tales, it is in these boundary places that I met my other, my underworld self. That hidden wild thing who loved and ached and blazed. That twin who had been thrown out the window the day I was born. Who lurked in the fringes. twin who had been thrown out the window the day I was born, who lurked in the fringes, steeped in the shame of being born other. I first fell in love at the age of 11 with another girl in my grade. It gripped me, this love, in spite of all the ways I was asked both explicitly and implicitly to unlearn this kind of love. So take love. How many ways can you count for love to decay? And what is it about queer love specifically that comes up for me when I explore decay? Quote, it makes sense that woods and forests have long been a queer space, writes Carl Phillips. Queer, not just in the sense of strangeness or alienation, but in terms of sexuality. If only temporarily, the trees erased the shame that drove us to seek hiddenness in the first place. For Phillips, the woods are shelter, tucked away from a society that does not accept him. But they are also margins, Places where he is allowed to become animal, to indulge in that most animal impulse with another person. Nature is queer, after all. It is only our culture which has erased this queerness, in people and in the more than human world. It is only our culture which has exiled queerness to the margins. Decay invites us in. It asks that we examine the fringes, the boundaries, the margins. Life and death are not so separate. After all, what makes this body but the dead plants and animals I have consumed? What shelters me if not dead trees turned lumber? What feeds the earth beneath me if not the fallen bodies of lives long gone? And isn't it wonderful to love it all? The living and the dead, the forest and the town, the male and the female, and everything in between. Don't the margins allow us to come to know our wild twin, our underworld sister? Don't they stitch us together? Don't they make us whole? Thanks, guys. That was a long one to sit through. <laughs> um, I think that's about it. I I feel like we can do like a maybe like a casual looking at art kind of a thing. But does anyone have questions? First of all, those pieces were just gorgeous and really Thanks. Um, knocked me over. Um, and I guess I am interested to hear how the art weaves into those pieces. Then. Them. Yeah. Um, so part of it is the process. Um, you know, I mentioned that I feel like this place is asking for something that is asking for something that I make to be unraveled. Um, so, uh, you know, this 
box, for example, my vision for it is to leave it as a place to leave offerings. Um, one really cool piece, um, I kind of fell in love with the outdoors in this place back in the Bay Area um, called Robert Sibley Park. And um, they have these like little stone labyrinths that we could like wander around as kids. And um, at the center, people left little offerings. Um, and apparently, um, William Randolph knew Robert Sibley, which I found out, um, which is really cool. Um, so there's something about like the pro the idea of like leaving offerings, gathering gifts for small gods, um, for the the small gods of decay or whatever. Um, that called to me. Um, and then one of the pieces that I'm working on is basically a representation of like Anana and Arishka Gill, um, you know, the above ground self and the underworld self. Um, yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? Well, thanks everyone for being here. Thank you.